Welcome to This Is Horror. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today we are going to be reconvening with Keelan Patrick Burke for part two of our conversation. Now, if you missed part one, all you need to do is head back one episode to 291, and we talk about Keelan's first experiences with story. We talk a little bit about the differences and the advantages over self-publishing and the traditional publishing deal. So which one to take in different circumstances? And then we talk about writing widely. We talk about writing about different characters and about people from different walks of life. So it's an interesting conversation. It's certainly a multifaceted one, and if you haven't checked it out, you need to. But of course, you can listen to these in any order, so by all means, listen to this first, and then when you're done, go back to episode 291 and check that one out. And in this part, we dive into the Patreon questions that a lot of you very kindly submitted. We talk about the creative headspace required for art and writing and whether they are different. We talk about what frightens Keelan and whose work genuinely frightens him. We talk a little bit about his new collection, We Live Inside Your Eyes. And let me tell you, if you haven't read that one, you need to. You need to pick it up. It's available now, so no excuses. Get that one. We live inside your eyes. And we also find out, thanks to a great question from our patron, Roger Venable, about the writing changes since Keelan started writing. So how has the process differed? How has Keelan's writing differed? We find out all of that and more. And if you want to shape the conversations, if you want to submit a question for each guest, you can do, so just become our patron. I'll talk about it a little bit more in the outro, but it's just www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror to check that out. All right, well, before I get into the conversation, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. The sun dips down under the old pier. Darkness fills the sky. Suddenly, you see glowing eyes rise from the shadowy depths. Female hands with razor-sharp claws dragging you into the night waves. The debut novel from David Irons, from Cosmic Egg, an imprint of John Hunt Publications. Night waves. Can you survive it? Available now at all good bookshops. From Eraserhead Press and the new Bizarro author series, it's I'm not even supposed to be here today! The new novella by Brian Asman. Clerks meets the evil dead when a demon accidentally gets summoned at a convenience store, leaving Scott Crane fighting for his life, his soul, and a chance to meet his favorite filmmaker with nothing but a fistful of greasy hot dogs and a souvenir slush puppy cup. Stephen Graham Jones says, I haven't had this much fun watching terrible stuff happen in a long time. I'm not even supposed to be here today! Available now. What an intense advert that is from Brian Asman. And, well, certainly matches the book, I will say that. And if you want something fun, if you want something a little bit weird, if you want something Kevin Smith inspired, you got to check out I'm Not Even Supposed to Be Here Today by Brian Asman, published by Eraserhead Press. And with that said, let's not delay. Let's jump into it. It's part two of the This Is Horror Conversation with Mr. Keelan Patrick Burke. And now for a horror interview. Well, let's jump into some of our Patreon questions. So right. the first one is from Kev Harrison. And he says, I've been really impressed, of course, by your writing, but also by the artwork you've produced. Is the creative headspace you occupy for the two art forms similar or radically different? 
and how much do you have to submerge yourself in a work of prose by someone else before you feel ready to create cover art for it? Wow, that's a good question. Um, I would say that there are, the headspace is different. I mean, it's definitely because of it, it's a different technique. And when I'm writing, I'm, I'm gone. I'm not here. I'm, I'm elsewhere and I, I'm just living inside it. And with art, I have to be very conscious of the viewer. I have to be conscious of how this appears in front of me and whether or not it represents accurately what the, the mood and the tone of the story. So there are different considerations. Uh, when I write, obviously I'm going for a tone and a mood too, but I'm not as conscious of it. I'm, I'm working from within it. Whereas with the arts, I'm working from the outside looking in. Um, when it comes to books by other authors, I generally don't read them. I would, I, I do so many covers. I wouldn't have the time. So what I'll usually do is ask for, uh, an excerpt of it that best reflects the book. Um, preferably one that has imagery that I can then use to inspire the artwork. Or oftentimes a writer will write to me and say that this is what they want. And they can either be very vague and just say, well, I want a clown on the cover with a bicycle, a uh, big dramatic font. Or they can say, you know, um, here's what I want, want right down to the cellular level. I want him to be wearing this. I want his one shoe to be pointing this way, the other way, the other way. So it's a collaborative effort. You know, I mean, I will get an idea based on what they tell me. I'll, I'll do up some drafts of it, send it to the writer. The writer allows it a year and and we're done. But um, it's a very interesting question about the headspace. I, I, I don't think I've ever considered it before. I enjoy them both uh, equally, but it's definitely a different process for me. One's on the inside, the other's on the outside. Yeah. And I know in terms of artwork that creating your own covers was another thing that came out of necessity. So... Yeah. I mean, were you artistically minded in the sense of like graphic design and illustrations before, or was this a completely new skill set that you came up with? I mean, you, did, was, you, um... you didn't come up with it. That's phrased badly. You didn't. <laughs> oh, I, I fucking invented cover art, but you know, you know what I mean? Was it a new skill set for you? He did. Man, if, I, wow. if I invented cover art, I'd <laughs> yeah. do so. Royal, that, that, that's what uh, this episode is going to be called uh, Keelan Patrick Burke on inventing cover <laughs> <laughs> yes I love that title <laughs> I, am, I am the Elon Musk of nothing <laughs> that could um, be another I, good title for the episode <laughs> <laughs> well I'll tell you um, I you know I was always interested in art I always dabbled with it um uh, in those periods where I spent long, long uh, stretches of time out in my grandmother's, it wasn't always something to do. So she had a workshop and there'd be these giant pieces of wood, wood and I would take album CD covers or cassette covers and I would replicate them on these giant pieces of wood. Same with book covers. I think I did Dean Koontz's Watchers on a, a piece of hardboard. Um, yeah, so I mean, I always messed around with it. I wouldn't say... I had a particular aptitude for it. What I did instead was I taught myself photo Photoshop when it was clear that freeware wasn't um, achieving the desired results. I basically, in as part of the process of this uh, three months of trying to figure out how to get books on available for Kindle, I integrated into that basically another crash course on Photoshop. And I'm still learning it. I mean, you know, it's been... Jeez, it's been about, what, 14 years now? I'm still discovering things about it I didn't know. They're constantly making changes. I've done tutorials. I, you know, anything that can enhance it and add to my list of tools is, is exactly what I'll do. I'm pretty much that way with anything. I don't like not knowing how to do things. So if I can learn them, I will. And if I can't, it needs to be erased from history so I don't look bad. That's a good role. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find that you can, as far as writing and then art, I know how I am because I can, I, I can draw them and draw. I started drawing before I started writing. Yeah. Uh, but I can't do both at the same time. I can't be working on a story and working on a piece of 
a, like a drawing. I can't, to me, it, it, for some reason, my, my brain doesn't, I guess because I put so much emphasis into one that I can't even work on the other. You know, are you are you the same way or you can do both or no i can do both and it's really out of necessity i mean and the thing is too mm -hmm. that um if i'm writing a story and uh i've been hired to do a cover for somebody that cover is or that cover is based on somebody else's idea so mm -hmm. i'm basically they've already laid the groundwork for me and told me what they want all it is is the challenge is to try and match that as close as possible to what I imagine they have imagined, which is tricky to navigate, but it is a separate thing. It's like basically if I've spent seven hours writing uh, something of my own and I take a break and then I basically look in the window at somebody else's idea and then try and paint it on the outside of the glass. So it's definitely two different, distinctly different uh, processes that don't interfere with each other. Yeah. Uh, and I, I can understand exactly where you're coming from because basically you're 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 not in your own headspace. Yeah. You know. So that that does make sense. It's just I I envy that ability. <laughs> so yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't. But generally speaking, I'm not good at doing anything else while I'm writing. If I'm if I'm deep into a novel, I don't want to do anything. And sometimes at the exclusion of eating and sleeping, I just have to be in that world and stay there until I find a satisfactory exit. But yeah, asking me to do a very work intense cover while I'm racing to the finish line of a novel generally doesn't end up with the cover winning out. Right. And if there are people listening who are considering dabbling with cover art and design themselves do you have any tips in terms of things to do and indeed perhaps things absolutely not to do yeah i wouldn't use uh, any of the page makers or the dirt cheap or free art available for those things because you can tell a mile away that this was somebody who used a cheap software program or microsoft paint and threw a bunch of images together that don't really go together. Um, I understand the necessity sometimes to uh, spend as little as possible. Not everybody has, not everybody can afford them. And I, that was me, and that was why I started doing them. But I wouldn't settle for something that has your name on it being good enough. I think that you should educate yourself on what makes a good cover, because otherwise you're just sticking some visually offensive pile of crap that looks amateurish on your book that you worked hard on and it's pretty much going to guarantee nobody's going to buy it so it's worth taking the time to read some articles on and see some examples and also look at what, what other books in your subgenre or your your genre or category are the big sellers and the most visually um the ones that stand out visually when you look at them even in thumbnail that should be your objective. And it doesn't require spending a ton of money to get a, a simple but effective cover. But a bad cover will kill your book. So, I mean, the simplest method is just to educate yourself on what makes a good cover, what makes it stand out, why you would pick up a book based on its cover. You should want to replicate the impact of that. Um, and if you've got the time and you have the ability, you should try and just pick up some rudimentary skills um, Photoshop, you can utilize free stuff. There's GIMP, G-I-M-P, which is about the best alternative to Photoshop and it costs nothing. Learn how to use it. You can, you don't have to read a 700 page manual. You can read a 12 page simple shortcut one and still practice and get what you want. It's, uh, if I can do it, anyone can do it basically. Yeah. I think when David Moody was talking about cover art, he said that his objective was just to create something that wouldn't look out of place in Waterstones. And... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. It should be something that, you know, matches your favorite books on the shelf. You don't have to get overly extravagant, but some of the best covers are incredibly simple. I mean, look at Twilight. That was that that image became indelibly associated with that series. It became almost iconic, and it's a fucking apple. Yeah, 
You know, I mean, that didn't take long to make, and it, it is now going to be remembered for all time. You can have covers that's just absolutely blank red with a white dot in the middle and have your name stand out above and below it and the title below it. And, it, you know, people will pick it up. Match it with good jacket copy. Match it with a good synopsis. And you can sell anything. But if it's a dreadful cover that looks cheap with horribly cut out figures, CGI figures stuck over a background they clearly don't belong in, with horrible blinding font, people will just be considering it a service to mankind to never touch that cover. Yeah. Or the book. Or the book under it. They will just go, oh my God, no, this person has no idea what they're doing. And it's damaging. You could have a fantastic book, but a shit cover will hurt its sales. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think Twilight You definitely don't want is, your cover. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I think Twilight is a good example of less is more. And I think perhaps for people who aren't quite sure what to do, it's often better to go more for something minimalist rather than that horrible amateur mistake of throwing fucking everything at it and now it looks a mess and out of place and some of these images don't really go together i mean if you just have a black background some good text a nice looking font and a you know striking image such as that apple and the hands then you've got an effective cover or have a solid cover, like, you know, a solid color as your cover and do something dynamic with the font. That's the whole crime noir method, you know, outside of hard case crime. If you want to have something that has visual impact, have a bright yellow cover and then in deep black impactful font, mm. italicized, big and chunky, have, you know, the kill shot. Yeah. And there you go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, you don't want your cover to look like, you know, when Matt Parker and Trace, you know, they did when they, <laughs> yeah. Matt Stone and Trey Parker did South Park, the first, you know, episodes. You don't want your cover to look like that. Yeah, you don't want it to look like you took four disparate elements and glued them on top of each other like some kind of magazine collage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> unless Unless you're going for that aesthetic, and then it better be damn good. Unless it's parody, you know, if you want to say, yeah. call your book shitty cover and then make it a shitty cover. And, <laughs> you know, there you go. I would, I would so read that book. <laughs> so would I. You know, but, <laughs> I, those, I might write. Those first episodes of South Park, were they broadcast? Like, was that what they actually released or are these things that came out later? No, they they were released. Uh, they're They're... They have a whole production team now, but I think that they insist upon it still looking like mm-hmm. it was like that. But I mean, they do it a lot faster. That's mm-hmm. the thing they can do. They can do an episode in a week where I think the first couple episodes it took them months to do one. You know. Yeah. But they they still want that same art look. You know, I remember seeing something in a you know, and, and I think they were saying that it has to have that same look. If it doesn't, then it's not it's not right. But they can, you know, they're like, well, now we have animators, and you know, so it's like before, I think they were literally like cutting out these things and gluing them together and then, you know, moving them around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, it's uh, you don't want it to, to look like that because even like they, they, the way they walk, you know, it's like they don't walk. They just kind of glide across the scenes. You know, <laughs> so it's just very, very humorous. Yeah. I'm going to have to now go back and watch the first season because it's obviously been a long time. It's pretty rough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but still, so I mean, just what's... You know, you kind of juxtaposition against that, the quality of the actual story. Yeah. And, you you know, it's like, wow, they they took crap and turned it into something that was actually quite good. Yeah. (laughs) Well, Ryan Whitley would like to know, name one writer whose work genuinely frightens you. And what is it about those stories that gets under your skin? Hmm. Ramsey Campbell, I would say somebody I think has been his stories consistently frighten me. I I don't think I've ever read one of his stories that didn't get under my skin. And it's his technique. It's his technique and it's his voice. Every time I read a Ramsey Campbell story, it's like walking into a room full of mold and mildew. And 
you voluntarily walked into it, but even the minute you step inside, you're feeling those spores going into your lungs and you feel the horror from the inside out. And everything, Charlie Grant was the same, actually. Everything that you you see in a Ramsey Campbell story is sinister. It could just be a coffee table in the corner of a room. And the sensation of it is like in real life, walking into a room and looking at that chair. And the minute you start turning away, something happens to it. And when you look back, it's normal. It's that constant feeling of unease and the atmosphere he creates, it's just absolute. His, his story just seethes with that sense of discomfort that something is off. Mm-hmm. And it just gets to me. I, I mean, he's one of the few. It's kind of like Stephen King, and I hate comparing anyone to Stephen King because that's what everybody does. I don't mean in terms of writing style. But with Stephen King, you know what you're getting into. You know the cadence of his stories, the, the lyricism. You know that down-home folksy, hey, come over here, have a beer, let me tell you about my day, kind of style to his work. And with Ramsey Campbell, I always know, before I read any anything of his, mm-hmm. and they are very nightmarish. Every one of his stories makes me feel exactly the same sense of dread and panic. And I love that. I love mm-hmm. that. It's, it's kind of what I strive for in my own work. Uh, I'll need at least another 75 years before I attain that level of... Um, I don't know. I think he writes perfect horror stories, perfect yeah. nightmare. So we're glad to hear that you're going to live for a very long time then. If <laughs> you need another 75 years on the clock. At least. Yeah. <laughs> but do you remember when you read your first Ramsey Campbell story? I know that it was early on because you mentioned him as one of the authors. I think you said that you checked out from the library. So was that around nine years old? No, I think I would have been, um, I mean, at least the ones that I can recall uh, were in the best new horror books, I think, or Year's Best or something. I can't remember which one it was, but he was a regular staple of those. So I know I was exposed to some of his short stories, but I read his novel, The Doll Who Ate His Mother, I think when I was about 15, and that kind of solidified it for me. I, I was supremely creeped out, and I followed that up with a bunch of his other novels, so I think... Uh, the parasite, the influence, um, a couple of more of them, uh, hungry moon, all that stuff. But it's his short stories I return to most, and I have been reading those a long time. And every time I see an anthology, he's got a new story in it. And I, I also, um, I uh, solicited one from him for uh, Taverns of the Dead, the anthology I put together. Which at the same time I, I got David Morrell to write one for me, but the one he did for that, the winner actually ended up in a lot of the years best, which was a funny kind of a full circle for me. That was how I discovered him. And to have the story he wrote for me end up in all those same anthologies all those years later was kind of cool. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, I guess going from people like Stephen King and James Herbert to Ramsey Campbell, it's such a radically different feel and a radically different approach to horror because, I mean... There's something almost cozy about Stephen King in the way that he'll bring you into the story. But as you say, with Ramsey Campbell, I think much like Thomas Ligotti, it is almost like a living nightmare. Exactly. I love Ligotti's work, too, for the same reason. It's just this whole, you don't trust in your narrator. You don't trust in the author to not bring you to places you can't get back out of. Whereas with Stephen King, he's kind of walking ahead of you, telling you what he saw earlier. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, his, his is the comfortable voice. I find nothing comfort in Campbell or Ligotti's work. I just find it steeped in dread. I love that, though. Yeah. And then I'm guessing another influence, or certainly someone I think you were blurbed by, is Jack Ketchum. And oh, yeah. I mean, I would say that there were certainly parallels between kin and many of Ketchum's stories, particularly, uh, I think it was his first one, revolving around the cannibals, which the the name has now escaped me, even though I've got it on my bookshelf. Off season. That's the one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, you know what? I actually haven't read Off season or the I think the sequel, Offspring. 
Yeah, I yeah. I had read those, and I'd only read um, The Lost and Red, I believe, by Ketchum. I read a ton of his short stories, but I had only read those two novels, and I haven't read The Girl, uh, was it The Girl Next Door? I don't know if I ever will, but... Uh, oh, man, it's, it's a masterpiece, but it's also very, very harrowing. I mean... <laughs> And I'm also aware of the case on which it's based. Like, yeah, and I mean, yeah. Jesus, that's harrowing enough. But um, yeah, it's funny. It does get compared to those books an awful lot, but I, I have yet to actually read them. And uh, I, I'm a huge admirer of his work, particularly his short work, because I find the mechanics of his writing to be very interesting. I, I you know, still do, even though he's, you know, he's passed on now. But and I, I was a big fan of the man himself. I hung out with him many times, many legendary times yeah, at, yeah. at conventions. But um, yeah, he was a great guy and I'm really, really supportive to to new writers. I think he didn't know me from a hole in the ground when I when I first reached out to him. But uh, yeah, it's it's a sad loss for the genre. He, he was certainly a hell of a character. But yeah, and I mean, I, I get that all the time, people comparing it uh, akin to those books. Um, which I find, you know, without having read them, I find that immensely flattering to have anybody compare my work to his. Yeah. And I mean, I think you're right about the short stories of Ketchum and anyone who hasn't read them, I mean, should rectify that immediately or at least after this episode has ended, you know, listen to all of it first and then pick up something like Peaceable Kingdom or Returns is a great book as well and that almost has a softer more subtle side of Ketchum so I think that's a good one just to appreciate the different facets of his writing yeah and that's what I loved about his collection Peaceable Kingdom particularly is uh is the range he has mm. you know everybody when you when you talk about Ketchum people tend to focus on the you know shocking gratuitous hardcore stuff that he did but right. i was always more drawn to the quieter ketchum you know like the box for example oh, and yes yeah people's stories mm -hmm. like that that's a guy who when he got in a certain mood wrote legendary fiction yeah oh yeah no doubt i mean yeah. i think the box <laughs> will be a timeless tale in as I much as it. something like Shirley Jackson's The Lottery is. I mean, there's exactly. just so much packed into it and there's nothing that would really date it to a certain era and no. the lessons within are, are just universal lessons as human beings. Yeah, exactly. Well, Roger Venable would like to know, has your writing process undergone any major changes in the past 10 to 15 years? And if so, what inspired or necessitated the changes? Yeah, these are great questions. Um, it has definitely changed dramatically. Uh, when I first started writing uh, with a view to publication, this would have been back in 2001, I, I think. I wrote relentlessly around the clock. Um, I would write probably three short stories a week. I'd write a novella in a week. Um, I wrote, excuse me, I wrote Master of the Moors, I think in three months. There is no way on earth I would be able to match that output now. And it's not so much about, you know, well, you get older and you slow down, which there might be an element of that. But honestly, it's just that I, put more care into the into the work. Now I'm more ruthless in my own editing. So it will probably take me about a month to write a short story and definitely about a year to write a novel. And there back then if I wrote a novel, I would be so caught up in the idea of finishing a novel, I would just submit it everywhere. Now I've had a novel sitting on my hard drive for the better part of a year that I won't go back to until I figure out what's wrong with it. And I haven't figured out what's wrong with it. And it could be two more years and it sits there. Um, I have a lot more patience and my approach to writing is a lot more measured, a lot crueler. Um, 
I am merciless when it comes to even the, the structure of the story itself, the visual appeal of the words themselves. I'm, I'm obsessed with how language looks, you know, um, things that I wasn't necessarily cognizant of years ago where I just wrote and didn't think about it. It just was scattershot. I would sit down and I would be, I'd put in marathon writing sessions, which I still do, but I wouldn't finish uh, anything now in that space of time. Back then I could write endlessly, which I think I wrote something like a hundred short stories within a year and a half. Right. Which is, that's insane. I couldn't do that over the next 10 years, I would say. Yeah. Uh, but I just take a lot more care now about structure and, you know, the rhythm of the languages. I, I wasn't always aware that that was a thing. Mm. I am now and I'm kind of obsessive about it. So things take a lot longer. To, uh, to answer what necessitated that, I think it's just learning more care for the craft and wanting the work to be better. I could dismiss it and just hammer out short stories if I want to, but I don't want to do that. I, I, want to, I want to take the time that I think the story needs so that it's as good as it can be. Quality over quantity. Exactly. Yeah, but I wonder if there's an advantage in writing quicker when you're just starting out to get that momentum, to build that confidence, and indeed to build that back catalogue of work. Because... I guess as well, there's, I mean, there's always going to be self-doubt, but there's mm -hmm. almost identity doubt when you're really starting out. It's like, am I a writer? Whereas when you've got enough stories and books out, it's like, well, I'm clearly a writer. Whether I'm a good writer, I might still question, but the label of writer is certainly non-negotiable. But if you're starting out, you know, you're not too sure of anything. So if you're doing it quicker, then I guess the quicker you're writing and the more you're writing, the more mistakes you're going to make. And hopefully the more you're going to learn from them too. Oh, that's absolutely true. And I do encourage that. You know, I, I don't regret it at all, that that high output and that just, you know, speeding through stories. And it was great. And it was basically like boot camp. Well, here you have the time, you have the means to do it sit down shut up and just keep writing and see what happens you'll find out sooner or later whether you're a writer you'll find out whether you're a good one you'll also discover all the mistakes you're making and the things that you need to improve upon them and there is no way to get better than to get better at writing than writing so you know the more you do of it i think the more um educated you get so it definitely was great. I don't, I don't look back on that time at all. I, if anything, I look back on it with fondness because mm -hmm. I was just creatively obsessed. I was like somebody on cocaine. I would be sitting there just blazing these stories out, and that felt amazing. Yeah. But it can't sustain itself, though. I'm sure for some people it can, but for me, I just I, I slowed down to a pace where instead of uh, throwing out straight to DVD films to see which ones were actually good, I was kind of taking my time to put these lavish productions together and, you know, get the right crew and the right sound guy and the right cameraman. And it could take, you know, four years for something to come out. But then I'd be sufficiently proud of that work and think that I did my best. Mm, yeah. It's a good question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we've got a question from Chad Lutsky, and he says... What is your favorite genre outside of horror that you draw from when writing? And would you ever consider writing a book strictly in that genre with no lean toward horror? Yeah, <clears throat> I actually enjoy a lot of genres. Um, I love uh, true crime. I love historical fiction. Um, mm -hmm. I love uh, Eric Larson's work. Um, I like a lot of literary fiction. I like mysteries. I like crime, westerns, love westerns, good ones, not the you know, not the usual peddled out, homogenized shit. But yeah, I read an awful lot of stuff. And if a book has you know, has enough appeal for me, it really doesn't matter what the genre is. It's the story I'm in it for. But I'd say if you know, put to the put to the, uh, or forced to select only one, I would say probably um, crime noir. And I think there's a huge 
uh, correlation between that and the genre that I primarily trade in. And I would definitely write one. I, in fact, you know, I've always argued that Kin is actually, it's labeled only horror because of the severity of the things that happen, but it's actually, I've read Crime Noir where it was worse. And I think that, I think it's a crime novel. Yeah. More than horror. And the sequel that I have um, about 100 pages written on and it's outlined is very, very strictly a crime novel. So I think that that's what I would do. And I, I would love to write more crime. I'd love to write a straight, I'd love to write a heist novel. I'd love to write, you know, um, one of the old fashioned uh, hard boiled crime books. I'd, I love all that stuff. So, I mean, I can, I can feasibly see myself doing one at some point. But in the meantime, I definitely have elements of those that I sneak into stories. I love the language. I love the mood of those. So yeah, it definitely informs some of the stuff I write, and I uh, absolutely see myself writing one in the future. Mm. Yeah, it seems like growing up and reading. If there, if I ran out of books at the library that would I would consider horror, that was my next go to was crime. Yeah, yeah definitely. Because it, I wanted something dark, you know, and and that's where you know you read Elmore Leonard and things like you know and, and people like that and Michael Connelly. Uh, so much of the crime was actually looking at it from, you know, the police or the police department or police forces, you know, POV, but you get to see it inside of, you know, the darker side of the world, you know, well, and and I, I, James it, Elroy came in on. And then, I think it's the reason that you see many horror writers transition to crime after a while, like Tom Piccarelli did it. He was writing kind of hard horror and then switched to crime. You have most recently Laird Barron has started right. doing fantastic mm -hmm. books and yeah it's just, i think it's a very short walk from horror to to crime oh yeah definitely you know more so than any other genre but um yeah so i mean i could do those i would also love to write a big epic western i'd love to write uh write a sci-fi book even though i probably never will because i don't know enough about it um and i'd have to you know know what i was talking about and i don't um but yeah, I would say most likely. I would love to try even a short story, uh, a Western. I've started a few of them and abandoned them because I keep getting haunted by the ghost of Joe Lansdale and saying, fuck it, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, there's nothing I would write off as, you know, a genre I wouldn't tackle, except probably historical bodice-ripping romance novels. I just don't think I'm equipped for that. Yeah. Well, that could be a challenge for you now you've said that. Well, that, you know, that being said, they pay me enough, I'll write anything. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So publishers listening, you know what to do. Get out your checkbook and it's going to happen. <laughs> I'd read it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'd read it, but I'd write it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we're coming up to the time that we have together this morning, but I mean, we've got to talk at least a little bit about your latest collection, We Live Inside Your Eyes. So tell us about the genesis for that and how it came about. Uh, well, the simplest answer is that I'm a sucker for collections. I love putting them out. I love reading them. Um, this one represents my most recent output. Uh, it's short a few that I didn't have the rights, that the rights weren't available on yet, the very recent stuff. But um, yeah, it's, it's a collection of short fiction that was published over the last couple of years in various places. Um, usually when I put out a collection, I try to add something new to it in case somebody has read all the other ones. Uh, but it tends to be just a, a single short story or something. But this one is different in that it ends with a rather lengthy novella and it's also got a new short story in there as well the novella that ends the book i would argue is the is the reason to buy it um the house on abigail lane is uh i don't generally write haunted house stories and i don't technically classify this one as one but it is about a house where since the day it was built including as it was being built people who went upstairs to the second floor didn't come back down and the story is basically the investigation over 60 years of the house's history and trying to determine why people vanished there. And it's done in a very kind of a 
Netflix documentary type thing, type style. Um, I guess you can't really call it found footage, even though there's found footage in it. It's fun. It's just it's one of these wacko, wackadoodle science stories that kind of refers frequently to the old uh, sci-fi magazines of yesteryear. Um, and it goes into Hollywood trying to capitalize on what was happening with the house, on the books that have been written. It talks about Amityville. It's kind of a sprawling story, basically, kind of, for me, poking fun at the whole idea of ghost hunting or about uh, ufology and Bigfoot and all that kind of stuff and how quickly we are to assume something either isn't what it appears to be or the obsession we develop when we're convinced that it is. And basically, that's it. It's just investigating how and why people have gone missing and how other people can go up onto the second floor and nothing happens at all and how it falls dormant for years and all the strange phenomena that happen in the area around it and how it affects the neighborhood. Yeah, it sounds like House on Abigail Lane might be to ghost hunting what Paul Tremblay's A Head Full of Ghosts was to exorcisms. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's actually, that's fairly accurate. I love that book too. But uh, yeah, it's this kind of uh, abstract approach to something that is usually taken so ultra seriously that I had no desire to do that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it was so much fun. It's it's the most fun I've had writing something in a long time. I think Sour Candy was the last time I just let loose and just kind of cackled my way through the entire thing. And this is very similar. I just, I just basically just sat down to write it and just open the floodgates. So it's fun. And people seem to be really responding positively to that as well. So that's always great. I think it's important, just like we won't, you know, got to get to a point to where it's as far as our reading goes, that we won't read anything that are finished. You know, there's no stigma in not finishing a book you don't like. It's it's really cool to hear that you that you're having fun writing fiction, because sometimes, you know, the work can feel like that it's not fun. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, I've, written, uh, I've written some stories that were absolutely brutal for me to write, and I got no enjoyment whatsoever out of it, and I had to just basically take two weeks off to get over it. Right. And and I, I know where you're coming from on that. And so it is it is refreshing sometimes when we do write something that we find fun. And, you know, it, it may be fun for us because we're, we're getting a kick out of what we're doing, even though the actual story itself, the subject matter, could be very, you know, problematic, difficult, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it, I think it's important that we try to, to, to find a way to have, you know, to balance, to have fun with what we do. And so, yeah. and I love hearing that. I think it's super cool. Yeah. And this one in particular, um, much like Sour Candy, is it's one of the few that it didn't matter so much to me whether it was good or not. Like I would have just decided whether or not it ended up in the book, but I just had such a great time, like grinning my way through it and just having a ball and co creating all sorts of weird phenomena, you know, and putting people through all this shit. I, I looked like a mad scientist when I was writing it. And the initial uh, feedback from the, my readers, uh, my uh, first readers was, uh, you clearly enjoyed yourself writing this. And that was unprompted by me. I didn't tell them anything about it. I just said, here, look, uh, there's the new, newest thing. Have a read of it. And it was just, and people reading it seemed to be grinning from ear to ear as well, because it's just kind of ridiculous, but it's fun as well. And right in the middle of it where you start to relax, then there's some absolutely fucking terrifying stuff in there just to upset the, the apple cart. I mean, let's just say that I've never, I don't think I've ever in my life written about clowns before, but there's one in this story that's worth uh, worth looking out for. Mm. And did, did you find with that that the momentum was such that you were pulling all-nighters and actually losing sleep over it? I mean, I remember you were saying before that sometimes if the momentum is such that, you know, you, you can't sleep, you just have to get it done. I started writing um, the last quarter of that story at about um, 8 o'clock at night. And I finished it at 6 in the morning. Wow. And then I, I went to bed for about four hours and got up, made some coffee, and started editing it and rewriting it. And I rewrote it up until about midnight and went to sleep and then got up at about 8 in the morning, edited it again, 
then sent it to the first readers, got their edits back. I worked on it, I'd say, from start to finish for about a month straight mm. with very little downtime. Um, but yeah, it's it's one of those ones like most of what I write is entertaining to write it, but I'm too in there to actually kind of get a sense of whether it's fun or not. And some of it's just taxing and tiring and I'm approaching big themes and I have to be careful and I'm, it makes me sad or, you know, miserable at various turns, depending on what I'm doing to the characters. And then other ones is like, it's a trip to Disney world. If Disney world was supremely fucked up and dark. and cold. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's what this one was. This just felt like a, it felt like a house of horrors, kind of a, a ghost tour type thing where, I wanted to get really creative with what I put the characters through, but it was also kind of sprawling in that, you know, the timeline of 60 years of investigations and, and, and occurrences in this weird house in a very, very normal neighborhood and how people just get on with their lives and that for a long time, people don't even know there's anything wrong with it. But, uh, yeah, it was a blast to write. There's been a few like that. Sour Candy in the Tent were two other ones that immediately jumped to mind as just being completely carried along with the story and just felt like I was on a roller coaster and loving every minute of it. Yeah. And I wonder, conversely, if you have a story where it's not ticking along and at times, I guess it can feel a little bit like pulling teeth. What kind of things do you do to get the work done? I mean, is it simply a case of just sitting down in that chair, brewing the coffee and doing it? Or do you have, any strategies or things that you do that just makes it come a little bit easier? Yeah, there's, I think it's kind of, uh, there's three strategies. Um, the first and the most obvious one that occurs to me when I reach that is to power through it. You're getting to, you're getting bogged down in something that, you know, isn't always uh, immediately recognizable as the problem. But once you can write past that part, that problematic part, you can always come back and fix it later. Maybe it's not a problem. Maybe it's the theme. Maybe you're making a character do something that character wouldn't do and you just can't see it yet. Maybe it's just a real shitty, depressing thing that you're not getting any fun out of writing. So you don't want to write it, but it's necessary. So you do and you move past it. The second strategy would be you're forcing the story to go in the wrong direction and you stop and rewrite. And you try to figure out, you take some time away from it, come back with fresh eyes and see, all right, what am I doing here? And is this completely going against the grain of the story? And the third and the last and the desperate one is abandon the story entirely. It's not working. You can't figure it out. Dump it. Come back in a year, maybe when you're going through your files and see if you can identify then exactly what it was you did wrong. Maybe fix it or not. Leave it in the graveyard. Yeah. And I mean, these days, how often do you abandon a story and what factors influence whether you do or don't abandon it? I mean, is there a minimum amount that you would persevere with? I mean, would you see it through to at least first draft or, I mean, well, uh, the, go on, sorry. The, the most recent example would be that novel that I finished and then started rewriting and left it with 40 pages to the end. And it was, it would have been, and is currently the longest thing I've written. And I just decided that I wasn't happy with it, that something's wrong. And I'm pretty confident if I gave it to somebody and they read it, they were going, oh, this is great. You know, this, it works. And I would be looking at them going, yeah, it works, but it's not, it's good. It's not great. Something's not right. There's something missing. And that could all be in my head, but I don't think so. I think there's something that's tweaking me about it that I've never quite been able to put my finger on. And that will be something the reader will be annoyed by. And the editors will be like, what the hell is this about? So I'm trying to give myself enough space where I can come back to it, like that it's completely unfamiliar to me and start reading it. And if I can pick up where I went wrong and it, fix it, then I'll release it. But yeah, I mean, that was the first time in my writing career where I have all but finished a huge novel and then walked away from it. I've never done that before. And, and I know I hear other writers going, ah, I was writing this and I stuck it in the drawer. I write this novel and stuck it. To me, novels are gold. I don't write enough of them to consider any of them expendable or 
to want to abandon any of them. This is like, I've written six to date, I think, including, I mean, this would be the sixth one over what, almost 20 years. I don't take it lightly when I manage to somehow write that much of something. And yet I did. I went, it's not right. I can't do it. I walked away. So I don't know what's, what the future holds for that. I'm actually funnily enough that we're talking about it recently have been thinking more about it. And I think uh, it might be time to pull it out and see what's what. Yeah. So I guess it's a case of watch this space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. I mean, I, I hate having something that I put so much work into and it took me the better part of a year to write it, to have it just sitting in there taunting me. So yeah. I don't know. I'll have a look at it sooner, sooner or later, and, and figure out if it's savable or if it just needs to go into the trash. It's a tricky one because obviously the initial reaction is, "Oh, this has taken a year of my time. I want that to amount to something." But equally, yeah. to get it right, it might take another six to twelve months of your time. And it's like, should I just cut my losses and admit that this isn't quite working for me? This isn't bringing me joy. And I'd rather, you know, work on something much like sour candy, where it is just going to be a great experience. Yeah, exactly that, you know, and I can't always tell if because something isn't fun, if that means that it's not working. Mm. Or if because something is fun, that the story isn't shit, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, I, yeah. I'm not great at that. I just know that I, my favorite experiences, and it does seem to be that the stories I have the most fun writing are the ones that resonate the most with readers. Yeah. So there's something there. I don't know. And the novel was pretty fun to write to a point. And then I started realizing that I had kind of, it's about intersecting timelines, and I think I just wrapped myself up in it and got strangled. So I just said, ah, Jesus, and walked away from it. Right, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I may have to go back and just, you know, break the whole thing down and see uh, see if it's if it's worth revisiting. Mm. And if it isn't, there are no shortage of ideas. I have at least two more novels bumping around up there that need to be written sooner rather than later, too. Yeah. Well... Thank you for spending so much of your morning chatting with us. No problem at all. I wonder where can our listeners connect with you? Um, well, there's my website, which is just my name, uh, KeelanPatrickBurke.com. I'm on Twitter at uh, Keelan Burke. I'm on Instagram as Keelan Patrick. Um, Goodreads and everywhere else. Basically, wherever people hang out, I'm there somewhere, sneaking around like some kind of... <laughs> Moron. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm on Facebook, but I hardly use Facebook anymore except to just slap up the occasional announcement of something. But uh, yeah, the last year or so, I've kind of drifted away from it. Yeah. I Me find, too. Yeah. <laughs> Me three. <laughs> I, I find Twitter to be my preferred social network these days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, do you have any final thoughts or is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to give mention to? No, I don't think so. Um, I think I think we covered quite a bit uh, for. Yeah, you mentioned this earlier, but for anybody, uh, anybody wants to check out the cover designs, I'm at elderlemondesign.com, which is funny because uh, Elder Lemon People say people always pronounce it as elderly man, like it's a Jamaican old guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's not, it's it's actually from a, a, a nickname my mom had for me when I was a kid, based on some Irish commercial. Um, but elder lemon and my brother is a younger lemon, so it's elderlemondesign.com. But yeah, it's the galleries all up there if people want to go by and have a look. But that's about it, I think. I can't think of anything else. I think we've uh, I think we've covered quite a bit. Yeah, and if people take a look at the designs and they like what they see, are you available for commissions? Yeah, always. Yeah, so, I mean, definitely, if you're listening and you're in the market for a cover designer, these are pretty fucking good. So, you know, check them out, see what you think. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you so much for joining us for the conversation with Keelan Patrick Burke. 
join us again next time when we'll be chatting with Gemma Files. And it's been a couple of years since we've had Gemma on the show. She's released a number of books since our previous conversation. And let me tell you, she did not disappoint. This is, as always, a very wide-ranging conversation. There's a lot of good writing advice. There's a lot about epistolary writing. And as always, Gemma is very candid. It gets very personal. It's one you need to check out. And you can check it out. You can check it out ahead of everyone by becoming a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. And I'm hoping that we can hit $1,000 on Patreon by the end of the year. And when we do, we are putting out two This Is Horror podcast episodes every single week. No excuses, no weeks missed. Every week, two episodes. And that is not the only reason to become a patron. You can submit questions to each and every guest. You can get access to the patrons only Q&A. You can become a member of the Writers Forum on Discord. We got some feedback recently from a very happy patron who submitted a story for beta readers for feedback. And in less than 24 hours, he got detailed feedback from four readers. That's the kind of value we offer on Patreon. And it's only a dollar to become a part of it. So you're not going to get a better writing group and better writing conversations for that kind of money anywhere else. So if that sounds good, if that sounds something that you'd like to become a part of, then do. Join the family. Join This Is Horror Podcast on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Okay, folks, a quick word from our sponsors. From Eraserhead Press and the new Bizarro Author series, it's I'm not even supposed to be here today! The new novella by Brian Asman. Clerks meets the evil dead when a demon accidentally gets summoned at a convenience store, leaving Scott Crane fighting for his life, his soul, and a chance to meet his favorite filmmaker with nothing but a fistful of greasy hot dogs and a souvenir slush puppy cup. Stephen Graham Jones says, I haven't had this much fun watching terrible stuff happen in a long time. I'm not even supposed to be here today! Available now. You're standing alone by the ocean. A beautiful girl moves towards you along the shore. Suddenly, you realize she's not human. You have nowhere to run as she slashes out, dragging you into the night waves. The debut novel from David Irons is a new chapter in terror. Night Waves, the novel. From Cosmic Egg, an imprint of John Hunt Publications. Available now at all good bookshops. Every episode, we like to end with a quote. And today, we've got a quote from Maynard James Keenan, the lead singer of Tool and a Perfect Circle. And I thought this was pretty fitting because tomorrow, at least at the time of recording, so on August the 2nd, All of the Tool albums are finally going to be available on streaming services such as Apple Music and Spotify. I know as a Tool fan, this is something that I've wanted for a long time now. This is something a lot of us have wanted. So, hey, here's a quote from the man himself from Maynard James Keenan. And if you don't live, you have nothing to write about. It's to the point, but hey, it's an important one. You got to live. You got to make sure that you're getting out there and you're doing things. You're having experiences because I swear the real magic happens. And then you've got something to draw on. You've got something to write about. I'll see you in the next episode when we'll be chatting with Gemma Files. Maybe I'll see you very soon if you're a patron www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror but until then 
Take care of yourselves. Be good to one another. Read horror. Keep on writing and have a great, great day.